What's new features the weird? The wonderful. And the downright scary. Weird cyberpunks. The wonderful distant cousins and that uncertain feeling. And the scary? Cape Fear, of course. See you after the break. The irresistible taste of Kellogg's Golden Oatmeal Crisp has got you into trouble again. How do you defend yourself? Did you eat all the Golden Oatmeal Crisp? I don't have to answer that. Did you eat all the Golden Oatmeal Crisp? Well, you're the one holding the box. Did you eat all the Golden Oatmeal Crisp? The Golden Oatmeal Crisp. Kellogg's Golden Oatmeal Crisp. With delicious honey-coated oats, raisins and almonds, an open box is an empty box. It's something new. It's something big. It's the new centre of Liverpool. The new European-style Renault Centre. Open March the 9th in Sefton Street near Albert Dock. Renault Liverpool. Come in and you could win a Clio. Secure, especially with the little flaps. I like them. They're good. Joe Reed has discovered Always Plus, a revolutionary towel with wings. You can trust them all day. They feel dry and fresh and reliable, and you feel confident when you're wearing them. Always Plus has a revolutionary one-way dry weave top sheet, which extends into protective wings that wrap around the sides of your underwear and hold the towel securely in place. Dry weave draws virtually everything into the towel, so the surface stays fresh and dry, and you have the extra protection of wings. I knew that it wasn't going to be a particularly long ride, so I thought, I'll wear them and I'll test them out. This will be a challenge. But, um, yes, they were, they were fine. They were really reliable. Always plus. Always fresher. Always drier. Plus the extra protection of wings. They are brilliant. <laughs> driving conditions, the new Michelin gives miles more grip than ever before. Make sure it's a Michelin. Every day I use a gentle moisturizer. It's absorbed into my skin to protect it throughout the day. It will help keep my skin looking young as I get older. I'm Yasmin Le Bon, and the moisturizer is Pure and Simple. Pure and Simple protects your skin today for tomorrow. Winfields are clearing over 10,000 pairs of mixed footwear, all at $4.99. Yes, $4.99. Like these boys and girls' shoes at $4.99, or these men's work boots and shoes at $4.99. And for the ladies, these shoes, some with genuine leather uppers, at $4.99. And these terrific trainers and football boots at $4.99. We've over a thousand pairs of these branded ladies' jeans to clear at $4.99 for a fantastic choice of fantastic bargains. It has to be Winfield's. The irresistible taste of Kellogg's Golden Oatmeal Crisp has got you into trouble again. How do you defend yourself? Did you eat all the Golden Oatmeal Crisp? I don't have to answer that. Did you eat all the Golden Oatmeal Crisp? Well, you're the one holding the box. Did you eat all the Golden Oatmeal Crisp? With delicious honey-coated oats, raisins and almonds, an open box is an empty box. Britain's favourite brands, Britain's favourite prices. Quick save. Well now, Becky Want and Bob Greaves report live from the What's New Club.
what's new. Live music from Northwest bands Distant Cousins and That Uncertain Feeling. Likely Loud Rodney Buse is here along with Ethne Brown, known to most of us as Chrissy from Brookside, to talk to us about their new play. And Bob Greaves once again heroically Hi. steps into the breach. Heroically? Yeah. Thank you. Winter's turning to spring, and as they say, a young man's fancy can turn to love. I wonder what that funny sensation was. Nature, though, can always be given a helping hand. I shall be investigating love tunes, music to seduce to, with a handful of experts, so you watch out. So poetic. Also tonight, the eerie and the downright scary. We review this. Somebody's out there. Come out, come out, wherever you are. Cape Fear, you'll have seen the hoardings, read the papers, now see the film, Scorsese's harrowing masterpiece. Also tonight, science fiction and its surge in popularity. We meet some Northwest-based writers, and in case you're wondering where Eamon is, more to the point, how he is, well, Dave here has been to see him. Well, he's had it hard, hasn't he, this week? He's had it hard, like, he's had his appendix out, right, and then he became the father of a bouncing baby boy. That's what the crew said, can you nip down to the hospital and get us a photograph? So I did. You like it? <laughs> Good likeness, isn't it? Oh, dear, dear, dear. Thank I had you, to see it in colour earlier on. I believe Dave's going to do a bit of mind reading and look into the future later. That's something to look forward to. Well, two can play at that game. I predict that this lot behind me are going to do really, really well. They come from Stratford, good local lads. They're called That Uncertain Feeling, and here they are with Sunriser! <laughs>
well for those of you with a nervous disposition to hide yourselves behind the sofa. Cape Fear is finally here. Martin Scorsese's film's already netted $70 million in the States and is poised to storm the box offices here. Early reviews in this country say brilliantly compelling, terrifying, and it makes Silence of the Lambs look like Bambi. <laughs> Cape Fear is the seventh collaboration between Martin Scorsese and Robert De Niro. This time, De Niro plays vicious psychopath Max Cady, who's released after 14 years in prison and hell-bent on revenge. Cady's warped mission is to teach his defense lawyer, who failed him at his trial, something about loss. But Bowden is increasingly powerless as he tries to protect himself and his family against the threat from Cady. This Cady guy is planning to rape my wife, but it's not your problem anymore. I can't bust someone for planning to rape your wife. You're a lawyer, Mr. Bowden. You know that. That damn well. The extreme tension of the film is increased by the effect that Cady's reign of terror has on the crumbling Bowden family, especially their adolescent daughter. Why do you hate my father? I don't hate him at all. Oh, no. I pray for him. I'm here to help him. I mean, we all make mistakes, Danielle. You and I have, but at least we try to admit it, don't we? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because your dad is not happy, your mommy's not happy, and you know what? You're not happy. Are you? No, I'm not. Cape Fear is a remake of a 1962 thriller starring Robert Mitchum and Gregory Peck. They both play cameo roles in this version. Scorsese's film is nerve-wracking and will keep your stomach churning to the bitter end with compelling performances from all the principal characters. With me tonight are Doug Bradley, a veteran horror film actor and film enthusiast who hails from Liverpool, and Simon Gelsthorpe, who's a chartered clinical psychologist. Doug, first of all to you. Now, this film has had a most enormous amount of pre-publicity. You've seen it. Does it live up to the hype? Oh, I think it does, yes. I mean, it's, it's a brilliant piece of filmmaking by Scorsese uh, with an extraordinary central performance by Robert De Niro. We all know how good De Niro is. This kind of role, I guess, is meat and drink to him. But uh, Max Cady is a character that is going to, I think, live in a lot of people's imaginations. Isn't it the same this. old Robert De Niro that we've seen in, say, Taxi Driver, don't you think? I there were certainly shades of Travis Bickle there, weren't there? There are touches here and there, but give the guy a break, you know. <laughs> I, I, I don't think it's the same old De Niro at all. No, I mean, this, this is an extraordinary construct of a character. And I think in the hands of a lesser actor, it might actually collapse under its own weight, because he's, he's everything. He's witty, he's got money behind him, he drives a flashy sports car, he wears the shades, he reads Nietzsche in the local library, he's, he's genned up on the Bible and philosophy. It's... Can you tell me, though, this is what everybody, all my friends have said to me, is it as good as Silence of the Lambs? I think it's, it doesn't help, really, to try and compare the two films, um, because there's a, there's a lot in common between the characters of Hannibal Lecter and Max Cady. The way in which they get to you are very different. You're like, hedging a bit here. I mean, you no, see, which do you think? Um, which do you think is the best? I, I think Silence of the Lambs. There you are. Well, I, I might well agree things. with you. I but that's not to say that Cape Fear is not a great film. It's, I mean, very it's a good roller coaster ride. Uh, absolutely right. And of course, you are no stranger to the horror genre. You are famous. Everyone here in the audience knows you as Pinhead from Hellraiser. And in fact, we do have a caption, I think, of Pinhead. There he is, Pinhead frightening can anything shock you now <laughs> oh yes certainly <laughs> not necessarily in the movies I mean I don't I don't really get frightened by watching films but um, can, let me just turn to Simon now I mean mm -hmm. you're a clinical psychologist why do we go I mean I'm as guilty as anybody why do we go and watch scary horror movies right. well, I think people go to the cinema for to get an, to get a feeling to get an emotion sometimes it's to laugh sometimes it's to cry uh, and I think there's uh, a great sort of pleasure that people get out of being frightened sometimes. There's a kind of great uh, thrill from the but physical... that's really weird, isn't it, yeah. to get pleasure out of being frightened? No, because I think part of being frightened is the physical buzz that you get, your heart racing, you know, kind of sweaty, you know, your blood's coursing through you. Any danger, thing. though, Simon, if you go and see films like this, that you might be tempted to uh, form copycat crimes? No, I think if you look at how many people go and see these kinds of films, if everybody 
was influenced by them would be overwhelmed by copycat crimes. A any copycat crimes as far as Hellraiser is concerned, do you think? It'd be <laughs> no. difficult, wouldn't it? Would it? Be, would be pretty difficult. I'm not expecting that to happen, no. necessarily. Um, one thing I would say in terms of the crossover to, to horror films, uh, horror fans will note the name of Freddie Francis as director of yeah. photography on Cape Fear. Um, who worked extensively in British horror films in the 60s for uh, horror, uh, for Hammer and also for Amicus mm -hmm. and uh, The Evil of Frankenstein. So there is a connection between Cape Fear and, of course, horror movies, although Cape Fear is yeah. possibly it's a, a horror thriller. It's a thriller, thriller, thriller. really, but, but where movies like Silence of the Lambs and Cape Fear and Fatal Attraction cross into strictly horror films like Hellraiser and, and Nightmare on Elm Street, it's not easy to tell. Okay, just finally, is it a must-see movie, yes or no? Oh, absolutely. You're it seeing is. Scorsese, perhaps yes the no. best director in America at the moment, at the top of his form. De Niro is the best um, actor of his generation. He's at the top of his form. Go and see it. I think that's a yes. Cape Fear opens around the Northwest next Friday. Here's a final taste of what you can expect. Good evening, ladies. I want you the hell off my property! This is my night, counselor. Ah! Ah! Good man's got to wrestle with the devil. Kate Fear, don't think my nerves could stand it. But if your nerves can, we'll enter this week's competition. All you have to do is to ring this number. 0898 100 195 and tell us the name of the gangster movie Scorsese made in 1990. And this week's prizes, Cape Fear t-shirts, would you hold that for me please? The Scorsese books, tickets to see the film at, thank you, would you hold that? At the Canon, thank you very much. The Canon Salford Keys or UCI in Warrington or the Warner in Preston and these That Uncertain Feeling albums and bits. So, ring now, results later, but now for a Watch New exclusive. Will you hold those as well for me please? Thank you very much, you're doing very well. The carry-on team, at least those that are left, Babs Windsor and uh, ooh, uh, Frankie. Mr Frankie Howard, by the way, was 70 today, it's his birthday. Round of applause for Frankie Howard being 70 today, thank you. Right. Well, Babs and Frankie are getting down to it again to bring you Carry On Columbus and hot and sticky and very wet off the press, the long-awaited script. Get your lips around some of these immortal lines, upside down, Bob. Ooh, uh, missus, mm, look at the size of that country. Ooh, missus, can't wait to dip me anchor. Ooh, what a lovely bunch of coconuts, missus. I think I'd better hand over to someone who gets paid. I hope he gets paid to make us laugh. I hope he makes you laugh. Mr Henry Normal, applause, please. Thank you, happening, Bob Greaves. Um... <laughs> So before we start, I think I ought to announce the, uh, the first winner of the new National Lottery. It's number 49361. Uh, your, hos your hospital bed will be ready on Thursday. <laughs> so that's, uh, so well, no, it's, nice, it's nice to be here. It's nice. I've been doing a lot of student gigs recently, so it's nice to have a live audience. <laughs> I don't, I've, I've been doing that many student gigs. I, I don't even notice I've actually got a spot. <laughs> that's how much I empathise with the audience, you see. I'll probably go home tonight and I'll have no fashion sense whatsoever. <laughs> oh, no, missus, no. Um, I shouldn't say that. I'm always going to the audience. I've only had one bad audience. Trouble is it keeps turning up to every gig. <laughs> so, uh, Bob uh, was talking there about Columbus. Uh, completely mad, you know. Uh, Columbus, that is, not, not Bob. Um, I, uh, I've actually written a poem to Columbus. What he thought, he thought the, not the world was round, but he actually thought that the world was pear-shaped. So I've, I've written a, a poem, it's in my new book, which is out, uh, out this week, it's not a joke, unless you read it. <laughs> in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. It diminishes not his bravado, he envisages the world as an avocado. Because <laughs> I wrote that in America, if you read it backwards, it says, kill your parents, kill your parents. <laughs> I don't think I'll be going seeing that Cape Fear. Uh, I saw a, saw a poster for it today and uh, scared me to death. Thought it was another food scare. <laughs> That's a bit of a method joke. It takes four or five weeks hard work to get that particular one. Um, it's topical stuff. Crap, but topical. Uh, so, uh, have you seen JFK? That's my favourite film at the moment. JFK. Anybody seen it? Yeah. 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 Take your sandwiches. <laughs> it's just a long film, isn't it? 
Uh, if you haven't seen it, it's actually uh, it's, uh, it's Oliver Stone's film about uh, the assassination of uh, J.F. Kennedy. I've actually starred in a new film called N.K. about the assassination of Vivaldi's Four Seasons. <laughs> oh, yes. Yes, uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was a nice film, but uh, I don't know, it dies in the end. <laughs> Sporty for you now, aren't it, really? What, what do you think, suicide? <laughs> Uh, I, I tell you what, they're Millie Vanilli, uh, one of the, I don't know if it was Millie or Vanilli, but one of them... Uh, <laughs> one, of, one of them tried to commit suicide recently, and the police got round there and, and found it was somebody else. <laughs> so it's a bit weird. Um, I saw the sequel, of course, to, uh, to, to the JFK, K2. <laughs> it's crap, apparently the, the, the mountain did it. So you can always remember where you were uh, when uh, Kennedy, Kennedy was shot, I don't. I remember where I was the, the week before. I was on the phone to Anassis saying, uh, yeah, but she's married, what can you do? <laughs> right, I think that's, uh, that's about all time for me. Yeah, enjoy the rest of the show. Thanks a lot. Bye. Henry Normal there, very much in demand. And you can see him tomorrow night at Alexander's in Chester or Sunday at Band on the Wall in Manchester or at Skelmersdale Arts Centre on Wednesday. He is, of course, the man who put Crumps all on the map in much the same way as the two Georges put Wigan on the map. But Orwell and Formby weren't available for comment when our reporter John Molson dropped in on Wigan, but plenty of other people were. It was 11 in the morning when I got to Wigan and the rain was still on the ground. I was neat, clean, shaven and sober and I didn't care who knew it. I was calling on four million dollars. Which is what Martin Afire would make if he ever carried out his promise or threat to take up American football. As it is, one of the world's greatest rugby league players should clear a cool million pounds from his association with one of the world's greatest rugby league clubs. But there's more to it than money. Martin Afire and a handful of others have brought glamour to Wigan and to a traditionally unglamorous game. I think it suffered through the bad image it had in the press, you know basically overweight men, you know, drinking lots of alcohol and basically just going out for another excuse to, you know, to, to drink more. I'm pretty into this sort of new dance, you know, revolution that they've got uh, going up in, in the northwest, probably in the forefront of it. I go to clubs like the Hacienda in Manchester and places like that, you know. I don't drink or smoke, so I find I can go out and socialise it and, you know, and still get up to train in the morning. I'm just in, based into dance music, rap music, people like, you know, naughty by nature on the rap scene, and just people like K-Class, you know, and uh, Oceanic and lots of other sort of, you know, rave type <laughs> music. Wigan's rich in musical memories, Limar was a Pemberton paperboy, John Lennon got beaten up on the station, and Buddy Holly played the North's first rock and roll gig at the Ritz, but the best was yet to come. This prefab behind me is Wigan's training centre, before that a careers office, and before that, Morrison's the supermarket. But before that... Do you want me to get down on my knees? Thank you, baby, please cry a million tears. At its peak, Wigan Casino had 100,000 members. It was voted the world's best nightclub. It was underground, exciting, and people were worried about drugs. Sounds familiar. So many people just really came down in coaches, wanted to know what was happening in Wigan. Um, other places tried to do a, a similar thing, but we really were doing the right thing at the right time, the right type of music, and the best venue. This year, they're relaunching the Casino Classics label, putting out the old standards on CD for 30-something soul boys everywhere. The casino itself is history, and this spring, Russ is writing it. These days, Wigan means jazz with the highly rated Wigan Youth Jazz Orchestra and a jazz festival the council runs in July. Wigan's very much of a, um, a sort of jazz town, if you like. Uh, the people who run the council are sort of 40 to 50-year-old men, whose sort of generation is like Glenn Miller and whatever. The fact is that there's, there's this big um, popular culture in pop music, which is basically virtually ignored. The only direct contact that the council have had with bands, uh, in inverted commas, in the last two years is to plant the posters down. So what do you do when you write Wigan's pop column and the railway children caught the last train out? Well, there's Verve, Monkeyland and the Tansads, especially when you're in the group yourself. And Wigan? The people from outside town 
view everyone that comes from the town as a little cloth cut and whip it and stuff. And when people actually come to the town and visit it, they find that everyone is, is, is not a, a sort of rugby playing fanatic, you know, who's, who's into George Formby and playing the ukulele, you know. If people actually visit the place and see that it's actually quite a happening town, uh, full of basically quite happy people, then it's, uh, the preconceptions are shattered. The street life starts Friday soon after 8. 5,000 people descend on Wigan Wallgate. 30 pubs and a dozen clubs within one square mile of the town centre. Yes, there's a bouncer on every door, but get past them and you're sorted. People come from far to come to Wigan. I mean, I went to the best place is Turnkey on a Friday. Be easy, you'll enjoy yourself. People rave about Wigan, but honestly, there's not a lot happening at all. There is. It's not, they rave about the pier. I don't go to the pier because I'm not a raver. But you don't have to be a raver to enjoy Wigan. See ya! Bye! So everyone... So you're coming into Bees Needs? I'll Wigan, so put Wigan. Yeah, maybe for a quick one. <laughs> you're buying. Guess she saw us coming, eh? But then Wigan's that kind of town. Next week, we put more people off their karaoke in Blackpool. Now, it starts with Valentine's Day and it peaks in spring. Yes, it is love. Mad March, when a young person's fancy turns to love and what better way to get you in d'amour than mood music. If music be the food of love, play on. If you take a look at today's charts, you'll find there must be a lot of playing on, going on. But do some songs turn up the heat more than others? Is Simply Red Stars more likely to loosen your clothes than George Formula's ukulele songs? Let me ask um, Wendy here. There you are, you've gone home with a boyfriend, he's invited him for a coffee and he slips a George Formby record on. Do you stay? No, get a taxi home. Get a taxi home. <laughs> Andrea, same scenario. He may be after a little bit of, or a little bit of, or whatever. He puts George Form. no he doesn't, he puts Simply Reds on. Definitely stay for the coffee. You stay for coffee. <laughs> I ask you no more than you stay for coffee. Right. We're moving on because, in fact, last year Brian Adams' top snog record, Everything I Do, proved that love songs, this is the time I put a silly hat on, by the way, are enjoying a major resurgence. My nightcap goes on because we're on the bed. Love compilations like all of these here, in love, that loving feeling, 30 all-time greats, are swamping the market. What's happening? Will 1992 see another baby boom? I've got three people here, all of whom you'll know, I think, certainly two of them, Mike Shaft, Sunset Radio DJ, and uh, notable for your love programmes. Michelle Stevens, Piccadilly Radio DJ, and notable for your love programmes. And Adam Hollywood, creative manager of Telstar Records, responsible, responsible in quotation marks, for many of these love compilation albums. Now, is there a huge resurgence in love mood songs, or are we playing games? I'm not sure there's a resurgence. I think it's always been there. I think what's happening now is that certain radio stations are now recognising this as a way of gaining audiences, and they're finally turning on to it. What's your favourite love, if you were, smoochy smooch mood? Uh, one of my favourites, I have to say, is, is this one. Larry Graham, an American singer, and a thing called One in a Million You. Absolutely gorgeous. One in Words a Million Mike Shaft, no no, 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 no. Michelle, what's your favourite? Well, because I think, especially for men, because they tend to be dumber in a box of hair, especially when in a really uh, lovey mood. Yeah. Uh, concentration's paramount, therefore right. lyrics can sometimes get in the way. So I would go for something more like Mike Oldfield's Tubular Bells. Tubular Bells. Do you go under the bed and play Tubular Bells on the old bed springs, do I wonder? Yeah. Often, but it, that means that they have to fix breakfast the next morning. Don't worry if the bed breaks, darling, I'll see you in the spring, as they say. <laughs> Adam Hollywood, is yes. it possible that this is just hype, or do people really love all this stuff? Well, I think uh, music's all about emotion, Bob, and, uh, and basically the most powerful emotion is uh, lust, I mean love. And <laughs> I think you meant the first one, didn't you? Uh, maybe, yeah. the, the two are very mixed, and uh, that's what it's all about. So when you get something that evokes a lot of emotion, then it's gonna be a big seller. You two have both, as I say, done programmes for a long time, you for a very long time. What sort of people 
come to you and say, will you please pay that, play that, will you please do this? Is it all young people? No, it's not. It's everybody from 6 to 60, absolutely honestly, you know. And the, the, the width of music as well, very, very wide. Do you Great think it's song. also possible, I didn't mean to interrupt you rudely, but do you think it's also possible that they, in this modern day, when people are behaving more monogamously than they have been, because of the threat of AIDS and so on, and less sleeping around, that love mood music is nice because of that? Yeah, it's nice because... They do try to like increase the atmosphere. Like Playboy's coming out with a new magazine for married men, which has the same centerfold every month. And because of that, and because of monogamy, I heard people you say do that. try to yeah. Yeah. brighten things up with candlelight and music and sexy food and things of right. that nature. Right. I'm going to lob the last one, I think, to you, Adam, because I hear on the old grapevine, takes off Nightcap for this serious question, I hear that apart from producing all these wonderful compilations of love music, that you or your company is about to stun us with a sexy LP, sort of to go along with those sexy videos we can pop into Woolies and everywhere else and buy these oh, days. Blimey, I'm not meant to talk about this, it's a top secret project. I know it's top actually. secret, that's yeah. why I've asked you. you stitched me up on this one, haven't you? Well, the videos have sold enormously well, I mean, sort of like, uh, it's basically, they're soft core pornography, I believe, that people can go into Smith's and under the guise of teaching them somehow to make love, they can buy it. And I think an album that uh, has a lot of songs like, uh, I don't know, what's the, the Bole Ravel's Bolero, yeah. some classical pieces, some uh, sort of, some, some lovely little love songs at the moment, they do very well. There is, there is a, a raunchy one on the way. Push, push in the bush, yes. Yeah, okay, <laughs> fine. <laughs> And just for the record, a recent Still poll around the Watson New Office, not a terribly serious one, showed that the top five records to test the bed springs are number five, Everything I Do, I Do It For You, Brian Adams. Number four, Suddenly, Suddenly, eh, by Billy Ocean. Number three, Sexual Healing, Come In Doctor by Marvin Gaye. Two, Unchained Melody, ah, The Righteous Brother, or two. And at number one, who else but Barry White, Just The Way You Are, Becky. <laughs> I think it's his age, you know. Coming up after the break, the soulful sound of distant cousins, the wonderful world of variety with Dave Spikey, Rodney Buse and Ethna Brown, and why this lot are wearing, well, this lot. <laughs> Free this week with You Magazine, Eurowise, the new four-part road atlas that covers ten countries, gives you city plans and route finders, keeps you up to date with Europe's changing roads. Plus, the chance to win this E-Type Jaguar. Start collecting Eurowise this week, free in You Magazine with the mail on Sunday. Lots of people are with a certain building society. It's been around since 1865 and hasn't gone in for mergers to grow bigger or changed its name. It isn't trying to be like a bank or anything else. It's a traditional sort of society and might be the one you're looking for. Furnace Building Society, where the people come first. Furnace. Passion for life. I'm so sorry. Did you pick up my suit? This wash is broken again. What's for supper? When I let myself fall for a man who had nothing, I knew. He'd never say he needed things, of course, but I knew. On my birthday, he did come up for a week in Paris, but in every bar and every restaurant, 
I knew. And everything we ever bought together, I knew. One day, romantic that he is, he said we could get married, really. What's mine's yours, yours mine, you know. I knew. If you're in the know, if you know that taking care of life's expenses depends on careful saving and investment, you're in the Norwich. Take a video recorder and double it. The result is the Amstrad Double Decker, just £399. How to water down your water bills. Spread your payments with direct debit. It makes bills easier to swallow. <laughs> You're a good audience now. Coming up, science fiction, Dave Spikey, Rodney Buse, more and more and more. But now, these amazing sculptures are the work of Jill Ireland, who's got a major exhibition opening very soon in Bolton. Jill, what is the name of that piece, please? Um, this one's called Crazy World. Um, it's made of steel. It's got all kinds of bits whizzing around, and it's meant to be a bit like the planet. It's gone a bit mad at the moment. I can see spinning the title. It's wonderful. Causing chaos. Are you working in steel? Totally, or most do you go of the through? time. Sometimes with plaster, but mostly steel. Mostly steel. Is it hard yeah. work welding and all it's, that? Yeah, reasonably hard work. Yeah. It's not as hard work as people think. It's a bit more like sewing than shipbuilding. You Is know, it? people always think you've got to be incredibly, you know, muscle muscle you don't bound need to, to be. do it. No, not at all. It's right now, what about this activity. amazing? What's this right. called? Right, this one's called Will Your Anchor Hold, and it's about this business of trying to anchor yourself to your hopes and your dreams on the one hand and like more material things pulling at you on the other and the anchor sort of balancing them up in the middle. In a word, who are you trying to sell? If you are trying to sell, who are you trying to sell them to? Well, they're difficult to sell. I do them because I want to, uh, but I also work to commission quite a bit. Big companies. Big companies because they're, you know, it's quite difficult to place them because they are so large. I must move on. The work of Jill Randall. Go and see it, please, at Bolton Art Gallery. The exhibition runs right through till May the 12th. It's there for a long time, but do go. But time for some music now. These are distant cousins who've just signed with Virgin, where they'll be stable mates with the likes of Phil Collins and Brian Ferry, but not Richard Branson anymore, of course. This is the latest single, My Brother, It's Distant Cousins. <laughs> Seems to have 
Time now for a look at what's new in theatre around the region. At the Green Room Manchester on the 11th and 12th of March, Out of Order Physical Theatre Company present OO, demonstrating a new set of possibilities for performers with disabilities. On the 13th and 14th of March, Teresa by Pascal Theatre Company, a true story of British collaboration with the Nazis during the war. On the 18th of March at the Green Room, the People Show number 98, the solo experience, and like anything else you'll see in British theatre. From the 19th of March, the Oldham Coliseum present The Killing of Sister George, second strider at the Blackpool Grand on the 10th of March with Four Marys, the sort of theatre that defies categorisation. Romeo and Juliet, still at the Royal Exchange till the 28th of March, unloved by the critics, but a lovely poster. Turned out nice again, world premiere of the George Formby story, starring Alan Randall, who else, at the Blackpool Grand Theatre on the 12th and 13th of March. And finally, the superb production of Bill Norton's Spring and Port Wine at the Octagon Theatre Bolton until the 21st of March. Don't miss it. So who would bear the whips and storms of time? So plenty of theatre to go and catch around the region. One play that I'm delighted to tell you about is a world premiere of Beryl Bainbridge's play, An Awfully Big Adventure. And it opens at the Liverpool Playhouse next Wednesday, which is uh, very soon from now. It was due to open almost exactly a year ago, but had to be cancelled when the theatre ran into cash difficulties. But all's well that ends well. It's got a great cast, and I've got three of those people with me now. I've got Ethne Brown, Rudy Davis, and Rodney Bewes. I'm going to start with you, Rudy, because you, in fact, are Beryl Bainbridge's real-life daughter, and you are playing your mother in the play. Now, is that a great advantage or a disadvantage? Do you know her too well, or...? I think, I don't know, I think maybe it's good, but uh, it's strange, because she's inside me, or I'm inside her. I don't know. But what does she think about the casting? Of me? Yes. I think she thinks she's pleased. She's pleased? Yeah. Well, I'm sure you'll do her proud. Yeah, Because she... you must know an awful lot about it. But I'm going to ask Ethne, because people know you very well as Chrissy Rogers in Brookside. Yes. And therefore you're virtually on your home ground over there. Well, it's not virtual, it's, it's real. Yes, I yeah, am. I yeah. live in the... You're on your home ground. Yeah. Now, this play is set in Beryl Bainbridge's own time at the Liverpool Playhouse in the 50s. Yes. But the play itself is set in the theatre, so the, the audience is watching the theatre within the theatre on stage. Am I, is that very confusing? No, no, no. not at all. Um, it's a wonderful piece of writing. It's very easy to do. It's very, yeah, it is, it's a very nice piece to play. And I don't think it, no, it won't be confusing. It's very well written. It's well, I've, nice I've heard it said that Rodney Bewes, Rodney, hello. I've hello. heard it said that you've said this is one of the best scripts, best plays you've read well, that's probably in a wrong. long time. I was probably wrong. <laughs> I shouldn't say things like that. Well, you either do or did you, you say don't. That? Well, I probably did, but I mean, it's probably a silly that? thing to say, wasn't it? All right, well, I'll pose you this one because I know from talking to you before the programme that you, despite all the work you've done, and I know you're fondly remembered as one of those two likely lads, and I hate to mention it, but Which people one? do. The other one. But you've never been to Liverpool before. I no, find I... that astonishing. I've never been to the North West before. Well, welcome really? to the North West. I've never been to Liverpool before. I think Liverpool is very funny. It is very because funny. Because the taxi drivers, which is my only yardstick of humour, <laughs> and the taxi drivers are funny people in Liverpool, aren't they? You and I could talk for an hour about the oh. taxi drivers and we wouldn't run this out of names I got, in this or I got in this taxi and the taxi driver said to me, it's Rodney, isn't it? Is your sister still in Coronation Street? <laughs> well, I haven't got a sister. Ah. Right? Oh, she's there, actually. She's there, so, she's over there. Yeah. The good taxi driver. This, this guy, this taxi driver said to me, he said, um, you're the best one in the like lads. I like you more than the other one. Has he ever met the and other I one? Said, I said, well, and he said, you're quiet, aren't you? <laughs> you're quiet, you don't talk a lot. I've got 20 seconds to ask these two ladies here yes, the last please, question. Please. Is it, I know it's set in Liverpool, <laughs> and it's opening in Liverpool, yes. but is it just a Liverpool play? No. Of course it isn't, no. It's about repertory theatre in the, in the 50s. Of course, people who live in Liverpool will recognise the names and the places and I don't it will agree be familiar to them. I think that's rubbish. Yeah. No, no, it's... it's Can I wish you, Ethne, universal. you, Rudy, you, Rodney, Ethne, Rudy, Rodney. I thought we had like 20 minutes. Teams. We don't have 10 um, minutes. It's that time again. Is it not, Becky? 
Oh dear, it most certainly is. That time again, thank you to you, Bob. This is now, I think you can remember my words. Welcome to the wonderful world of variety with Dave Spikey. <laughs> Welcome once again to the wonderful world of variety and tonight's The Paranormal. Do, 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 do. <laughs> Mind reading and thought transference, ladies and gentlemen, because people come up to me and they say, David, you're septic. And I am. I've got the gift. Because the unknowable, I know. The undoable, I do. And the inscrutable, I scrut. Right? <laughs> I do. Because I've got that gift. I've got that TCP, ladies and gentlemen. I've got that TCP. I get the voices. I get the mysterious voices. I had one today before I came out on the phone. He said, is that 777777? I said, it is. He said, can you phone the fire brigade? I've got my finger stuck in the phone. <laughs> so it's one of those. But I'm going to demonstrate that for you tonight, ladies and gentlemen. This man here. You are a Virgo. Gemini. Gemini. I knew that. And I know that, ladies and gentlemen, because I was born on the cusp. On the cusp of Leo and Capricorn. Yes, I'm a leprechaun, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> My brother is a Caesarian. <laughs> it doesn't normally bother him, but when he parks his car, he has to get out through the sunroof. You know. <laughs> My sister's a Pyrex, because she was like a test tube baby, you know. <laughs> She's all right, but like, it's a bit embarrassing on Father's Day, because she always has to buy a little present and put it in the fridge. But, <laughs> but she's a lovely girl. I lo talking to lovely girls, I need a volunteer. I'm going to pick you. Can you stand up, please? <laughs> well done. <laughs> I'm in your mind, 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 I'm in your mind. I've written a word on the back of this card. Do you know what that word is? It. No. no, correct. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. Please, 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 this lady, stand up. Your name is Agnes, yes? Uh, no. <laughs> when it works that, it's really brilliant. Right? <laughs> I've drawn a picture on this card. It's an animal, right? It's an animal. You've got two choices. I'm looking at the picture. I'm looking in your eyes. I'm in your mind. 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 <laughs> is it a penguin? Is it a penguin or is it a rabbit? <laughs> it's just one of the two, right? One of the two. It's a first choice. It's a first choice. So we've either got a rabbit or a penguin. Right? One, two, three. Penguin. Penguin. <laughs> it is indeed a penguin. <laughs> a penguin. The world of adventure inhabited by Dave Spike, and if you like big adventures, ones that move through inner space to outer space, then you're probably a sci-fi fan. There are many and various imaginary worlds out there, and we got hold of three contemporary writers, two of them from the Northwest, one from America, to explain the current science fiction scene. Here you go. I think it's coming up. <laughs> Fiction Cell. It's one of the traditional forms of pulp fiction. Is science fiction escaping? Many writers wax nostalgic about the science fiction comic books they read as teenagers. But they desperately want to be taken seriously, so they're always thinking up baffling new labels to describe their writing. I've seen Martin had been dreaming a great deal lately, much more since joining with Teresa. He had been dreaming of Earth. Dreams the heyday of science fiction pulp was the 1950s, when Greg Bear was growing up in California. He's been described as a technical literalist, which means he uses hard science for the theoretical sources of his work. Anvil of Stars is his latest novel. My, my theories in, in this story are pretty fresh, and a lot of physicists would also agree that they don't understand them and probably don't agree with them. Uh, I, I refer to them as my crackpot theories, because they're not serious science. They, they may appeal, they may be of interest to scientists, but I don't mean them to be taken as actual papers on physics. They are, are theories which allow me to make the story credible. Born in Holland, Lawrence Blomendahl now lives in Manchester and is published by a Manchester-based company. He's been a DJ, a university lecturer and an ice cream seller. He writes in a style which emerged in the science fiction of the 1980s. 
cyberpunk. When cyberpunk arrived, which was very hard, very edged, hardly any morality in it, basically this was the world as it was going to be. People alive in a computer space, also inhabited by organic uh, uh, entities, which was so alien to anything that had gone on before. Uh, I think it sort of took most people by surprise, including me. Behind one of the men stood a sound system, double charged, looming, dark and powerful, twitching and shaking, a living organism. Zander could feel it trying to read his mind, warm tendrils probing his cells. He stepped back out of reach. The tallest of the two men walked up to him. He realized these men were different, not the ones he had seen before that time with his dog. I always felt whenever I read any science fiction that there wasn't enough music in there. And I don't mean in a sort of uh, a James Last type of way. I mean hardcore, really serious music. And uh, because of my background and what I found in Manchester and in Britain, in the clubs and the way the music developed throughout the 80s, I felt I, well, I wanted to incorporate that somewhere in science fiction. Trevor Hoy lives in Rochdale. He writes speculative fiction taking, say, environmental trends and extrapolating them into worst-case scenarios. The, the, the good science fiction, the stuff that I think is food for food the mind, what it's doing, it's actually looking at today from a different angle, from a different perspective. It can be from the future, it can be from the past, uh, it can be from another planet. What, they're trying to, what I think the writers are trying to do is get an objectivity of what is happening now, so we look at it afresh. Differing perspectives on the world of the present, but how will science fiction change as the world approaches the millennium? The challenge that I put out to writers in the 90s is write the kind of fiction that is fully the equal of or better than, and certainly more challenging than, any other kind of literature being done. And yet at the same time, maintain the standards of good old science fiction. That is, show us something astonishing. Show us something that expands our thoughts. Show us something that we've never seen before, or show us something that we've seen before, but not in quite that way. If you can do all of those things, if you can show us the real world through a glass, skewed or darkly, you know, pessimistically, optimistically, and if you can do it with the very best writing skills you have, there's a place for you in science fiction. Well, as you can see, sci-fi freaks don't confine their obsession to the art si-fi novel. These are cyberpunk. Hello, Tristram. You Good evening. Cyberpunk you. What is a cyberpunk? Can you explain what this ridiculous garb is, really? Well, if you're very interested in the future and so forth, we like doing um, more playing games and a few things like that. We also like watching videos like, say, Blade Runner. Whoa. Whoa oh, yeah, it's OK. Uh, it's futuristic in here. Gavin, you tell me about some of the clothes that you wear. Well, it's a real mixture. It's protection against everything. Um, the environment, violence. So you're quite green, are you, really? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you look quite green and blue. Oh. It's very warm here. Yeah. They wear them oh, where, where, wherever sorry. they go, apparently. Competition results now. Goodfellas was the Scorsese gangster movie we were looking for, and those words. And the winners, Tristram, you have them there. Hi, they're Philip Moffat, E. White, C. Bramwell, and Francis Chambers. Well done to you. Next week on What's New, Jessica Tandy will be spilling the beans on her latest film. It's called Fried Green Tomatoes at the Whistle Stop Cafe. Sounds more like science fiction, but it isn't science fiction. Nicholas Parsons, no less, will be here. Will I? I don't know. And there'll be no jokes about Vickers climbing trees. Thank you very much. Laughs from Roger Monkhouse, no relation to Bob. I think she means Bob Monkhouse. Bob Monkhouse, as far John as John Moulton will be in Blackpool. And Judy Garland will be with us. And we'll be revealing the little-known truth about Lou Reed. You won't believe what we found out about him. Now now then, Eamon, you get, get well, well soon. soon. Mm -hmm. We miss you, and it's way past the bedtime of a man of my years. <laughs> and to play us out, distant cousins with you used to. Good night. <laughs>